welcome, uh, welcome everyone to the, uh, what I hope is the first in a long series of uh, Weaver Fellow reunions. Um, I thank all of you for coming. It's, it's such a, a pleasure to see you. It's a, a distinguished, uh, accomplished group and a group that has committed, has uh, accomplished so much for our country and so much for our movement. And it's just wonderful to have all of you together. And I hope we can, if you see Johnny, please encourage him to make this an event that we'll do every year. Um, <clears throat> today I have a, a distinct pleasure um, to introduce our speaker. And to begin doing so, I'd like to take you back uh, to 1982. Some of you weren't born in 1982. Uh, some of you were well into your career in 1982, but uh, if you don't know anything about that year, let me remind you a bit about it. Um, the best-selling uh, piece of music, best-selling song in America was Let's Get Physical by Olivia Newton-John. There, there was a new technology called uh, video cassettes, and the best-selling video cassette um, was by Jane Fonda. It was known as the Jane Fonda Workout. Uh, we were in the midst of a fairly deep recession, and uh, unfortunately, in the election of 1982, Republicans lost something on the order of 26 or 28 seats. And the Washington Post and the New York Times um, had lead articles after that election. Um, uh, reporting the demise and the, the demise of the conservative movement and the failure of the Reagan administration. Um, uh, luckily, in 1982, we had a president named Ronald Reagan, and we had Weaver Fellows. And one of the most distinguished Weaver Fellows was a Weaver Fellow from the class of 1982, and I'd like to introduce you to him today, uh, Bill McClay. Uh, as a point of background, like so many other Weaver Fellows, he is an outstanding scholar and teacher. Uh, the Organization of American Historians honored Bill with an award for the best book in American intellectual history for his work, The Masterless Self and Society in Modern America. For nearly a decade, he has served as the University of Oklahoma's Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty. And this fall, we're all delighted to say that this fall, he will join many other Weaver Fellows on the faculty of Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College is, of course, run by another Weaver Fellow, uh, Dr. Larry Arn. Uh, but, Mil but Bill McClay has extended his influence well beyond the academy. Last year, he received ISI's Conservative Book of the Year Award for his inspiring history of the United States, Land of Hope. Uh, the book is a desperately needed corrective to the 1619 Project and the growing movement to portray American history as one long tale of uninterrupted oppression. Hillsdale has created a marvelous online course based on Land of Hope. Bill is so well respected that he is a member of the United States Commission responsible for planning the 250th anniversary of America's founding. Previously, he spent more than a decade on the advisory board of the National Endowment for the Humanities. In the nearly 40 years since his Weaver Fellowship, Bill has remained active with ISI. His student guide to US history is the best-selling title in ISI's acclaimed series of student guides to the major disciplines. He speaks frequently at ISI conferences and serves as a mentor in the honors program. Looking back on his ISI fellowship, Bill has said the fellowship fortified me in the task of taking the independent task, it, on taking the independent path that I had always intended to take. The path has led him to an extraordinary career Along the way, he has given many thousands of people a true education in American history. I'm thrilled he can be here today. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Wilfred McClatchy.
just to defend myself against uh, you know campus intruders. That shouldn't happen too much at Hillsdale, but you never know. Uh, thank you very much. That was really wonderful. Uh, too much, but too much is just enough. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really delighted to be here for all sorts of reasons, but I think this, I, I said this earlier today, and uh, I, but I want to say it again, I think this homecoming idea is a, a wonderful, a wonderful idea, and I know it's hard for people to do it every year, but it would be good to do it very frequently. And uh, I think for me, the, the, the term is, uh, it, it, it's not merely a sort of sentimental term. This really is a kind of home, a kind of intellectual home for me. And, you know, ISI has been through lots of tribulations, as we all have, but it somehow always comes out uh, free and alive and vital. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to many years ahead with Johnny at the helm and with all of you in the same room and, and, and tugging at the same oars uh, with us. Um, and my Weaver Fellowship really was important to me. It kind of came at a time when uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, my graduate institution, was rather penurious about financial aid. They, they can't get away with doing a sort of year-to-year -year thing the way they did at that time in the, the 80s. And, uh, and I actually was looking at not getting financial aid because uh, they didn't like my politics, my political views. And along comes the Weaver Fellowship, and it sort of bailed me out. So uh, it's, it really, and I think of it really as a fellowship. I think all of the Weaver Fellows that I know are, are people to whom I feel a connection, uh, even 30-some years later. Um, and uh, so those of you who are younger Weaver Fellows, I think you can think of this as your initiating, initiation into something that could be a lifelong connection, and I urge you to, to do that. Um, okay, I, what I want to talk about today is history. That's my field. Uh, I'm not uh, plumping for departments of history. Uh, part of what uh, the Tom Lynch has commented about my independent path is that I've never held a departmental designations to be uh, sacrosanct, to put it mildly. So a lot of the best history comes from political scientists, journalists, uh, ordinary people uh, who are chroniclers of their, their culture and their time and place. <clears throat> but I do defend history as a way of thinking, a way of thinking about the, uh, uh, about the past. Um, history ought to be among the most humbling and humanizing of subjects. It opens the world to us in all of its gorgeous variety, both as it is and as it has been. It provides us with a window onto the astonishing range of human experience, from the earthbound world of lowly peasants and slaves and outcasts, to the rarefied universe of the high and mighty, and wealthy, uh, the saints and scoundrels, and everything in between. History's forays into unfamiliar territory can shock us and enlarge us. They make us aware of the many ways that human beings have gone about the business of being human. By rescuing precious things and memories from the darkness into which they would otherwise disappear, it gives us a sense of continuity with our own past and gives support to our sense of human possibility. I felt the, the third panel today did that for me. As especially so if we seek to provide an, an honest and balanced record of humanity's achievements and enormities alike. And we're wise enough to acknowledge the mixture of motives, both noble and ignoble, that each and every one of us flawed human beings bring to life's tasks. That, at any rate, is how it ought to be. But today, instead of expanding our minds and hearts, history is increasingly used to narrow them. Instead of being a way of deepening ourselves and helping us to take 
a mature and complex view of our past. History is increasingly being used as a simple bludgeon, which picks its targets based on a simple litmus-like standard, often little more than a popular cliche applied mechanically. Of course, the New York Times' 1619 project, uh, which we've already heard a little bit about, would be a good example of that, uh, a way in which our, our sense of the American past is being reduced to a caricature, an imposition, a crude imposition of present day politics on the complexity of the past. A more disturbing example of this pell-mell rush we, we've seen in recent years, really especially in the last year or so, uh, passing judgment on heroes of the past and tearing down or renaming the monuments to them the George Washingtons, Thomas Jeffersons, Woodrow Wilsons, and the like. Uh, just as disturbing as the fact of these uh, statues being torn down is a lack of resistance to that from public officials and, and even from the public at large. Are we really so fragile uh, and so faint of heart that we can no longer bear to allow the honoring of great men of the past who fail in some respects to meet our current specifications. Yes, it is true that all three of the men I named either held slaves or had racial beliefs that we would find unacceptable today. Does that negate everything? Does that exhaust everything that we need to know about them? Uh, ought it outweigh the value of everything else that they did? In Woodrow Wilson's case, I might be inclined to agree, but, 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 but we'll leave that aside. Apparently, in some people's minds, it does. For them, the transformation of history into a weapon depends on a brutal simplification of the historical record so that Washington's ownership of slaves becomes the only relevant fact about him. A genuinely historical use of history would acknowledge and even insist upon this fact. But it would also then go on to consider uh, from the larger perspective of a longer and more important uh, and consequential life, consequential life. It would weigh Washington's beliefs and actions carefully in the context of their time and would take into account his courageous decision to free his slaves at the end of his life. That kind of respectful detail and complexity are what we are no longer getting. Instead, we get patent idiocy. Uh, uh, you may remember the case of the public high school in San Francisco that was spending up to $600,000 to paint over a historical mural of the life of Washington, uh, 83 years old, 1,600 square feet, uh, painted by a communist, or at least certainly a, a hard left-leaning artist, who wanted to include Washington's ownership of slaves as part of the portrait of him. But the school board decided that this image was too disturbing to children. The mur mur mural was racist and degrading in its depiction of black and Native American people. Better to have plain white walls, white walls, I know, that, <laughs> than any that would tell a true and complicated story. So this weaponizing of history, as I call it, corresponds invariably with a remarkable hostility to history. It's content to extract a single fact out of a complicated web of details and then to drive that fact home with repetitive stubbornness, the stubbornness of protests who know only to repeat their memorized and idiotic chants. History used to be a discipline designed to expand our imaginations, enlarge our moral sympathies, allowing us to take a productive distance from the polemics of the present, to enter into the minds and hearts and experiences of those who lived in a world very different from ours. It also frequently involved a nuanced appreciation of the lives and achievements of those who came before us. The point of studying history was not merely to gather ammunition for the latest political firefight, but to seek out the intricate patterns 
that connect the past and the present, deepening our sense of the full range of human activities and possibilities, and developing in us a humane sensibility that's capable of seeing the human prospect in all its glory and shame reflected in a variety of circumstances. But today, that's a luxury no longer allowed. Far from attempting a judicious distance from the present, history has become drafted into its battles. If we seem to be hearing more about the past, it's only because our culture's use of the past is entirely functional and ideological, subservient to the perceived uses of present day politics. The woker, the better. I love these ungrammatical expressions. <laughs> that the greatest use of history may be the distance it provides, the ways in which it releases us from the prison house of the present, of our relentless present-mindedness. It surprises us with things that we could not otherwise have imagined. This is not considered. This self-willed cognitive imprisonment is a version of the same malady that's dragging down all the humanities. Even venerable and relatively esoteric fields like classics now feel under pressure to address themselves to issues of white supremacy, not only by way of disparaging the field's past practitioners, but critiquing the core subject matter of the field itself. The result is a growing impoverishment of our intellects, an attitude of cheap condescension towards our predecessors, and a sense of futility about almost any intellectual endeavor considered apart from politics. One should be especially concerned about what American students are learning about the history and government of their own country. Obviously, I wrote a book <laughs> out of concern for it. After all, one of the chief arguments for universal compulsory schooling has always been that a liberal democracy like ours cannot long survive without a critical mass of properly educated citizens who understand the origin of our constitutional systems, know their rights and responsibilities, respect the rule of law and the fundamental practices it underwrites. Look around you and ask yourself how well we've been teaching those things of late. Can we do better? Can we do better for the next generation of students? Will they become grounded in a knowledge of the American story, the story of how a nation built on the foundations of religious faith, Republican self-rule, and economic opportunity came into being in the British colonies of North America, established the world's oldest constitution, became the freest and most prosperous land in the world, albeit an imperfect land that has struggled repeatedly to correct its sins and deficiencies. And yet, a land that opened its arms like no other to the world's exiles and went on to defend the cause of freedom the world over. A land, by the way, that most of the world seems to want to get into for some curious reason. Or will they encounter something different, a 1619 Project version of American history that, with apologies to Johnny Mercer, will accentuate the negative? Or perhaps worst of all, will they come away with a sense of history as a disorganized hodgepodge of dates, events, factoids, names, textbook sidebars, a themeless pudding, just one damn thing after another? which is a kind of philosophy of history. I, I, I would acknowledge one damn thing after another. Calvinists like that, one damn thing after another. Uh, a formless grab bag where the only order is the shape that someone arbitrarily chooses to impose on it for some plastic, passing political or weaponized purpose. Will such an account of the past contribute to their sense of the American past as part of their lives? Or will it immunize them against taking any further interest? These days, there's another obstacle supplied by what the writer John Dos Passos called that idiot delusion of the exceptional now. 
He didn't mince his words. That idiot delusion of the exceptional now with a capital N. It's always been hard to get young people interested in the past. I certainly wasn't interested in it when I was young. But it's even harder today because they're convinced that we are living in such an unprecedented time. The technologies shaping our world are so transformative that there's really no point in learning about what went on in the 16th century or the 17th century or even the 19th century, maybe not even the 20th century. It's all been superseded just as our present world is already in the process of being superseded yet again. While this may be an exceptionally lazy view of things, it also represents an honest and understandable conviction, something that we have to deal with to meet, as you've all said, to meet people where they are. It's reinforced by this endless parade of sensations and images in which we're all enveloped one damn thing after another, always being succeeded by something else. Nothing is ever permanent. Nothing is enduring. Things are always moving, 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 moving into the next exceptional now. Uh, if that were the only way you had ever experienced the world, how could the past possibly matter to you? But this is exactly why we have formal in institutions of formal education, and I emphasize that word institution, formal education. In order to train the mind to skills that the ambient culture uh, does not automatically provide. Skills, in fact, that are desperately needed to counteract the culture's corrosive influence. One of those skills is the art of memory, the very thing that a culture of ceaseless change tends to erase. Such erasure represents a mortal threat to our very humanity and must therefore be resisted. Without memory, our life and thought dissolve into a meaningless, unrelated rush of events, and we become helpless and easily tyrannized, even if we're technologically advanced. So absent a force mounted against them, these waves of daily events will swamp all our efforts to connect past, present, and future. They'll obstruct our understanding of the things that unfold in time, including the path of our own lives. And they'll blind us to the gratitude we owe to others for all that we have been given. Gratitude is one of the greatest of the civic virtues, but it's impossible without the broad horizons of memory. You can't be grateful if you can't remember the reasons why your, your gratitude exists or should exist. An excessive absorption in the circumstances of the present and particularly the identity group grievances of the present projected back into the past we've been talking about all day. This will dissolve our sense of common, a commonality, of a common American story, a larger story whose glories vastly outweigh its faults, a story studded with moments of grandeur at places as different as Normandy, Selma, Lexington, Gettysburg, and Arlington. John Dos Passos, who I mentioned in passing, uh, lived in a very different time. But he understood all of this with great clarity. Writing in 1941, a, the, a year in which Hitler, which began with Hitler in control of most of Europe, pretty much all of continental Europe, with only the British Isles holding out, the United States not yet in on the war effort. Uh, the entire world, though, uh, the rest of the world at war and back on its heels. Um, at this time, Dos Passos wrote an essay called The Use of the Past in which he offered a defense of history and not just of history as a record of the past, but of historical knowledge as a treasury of memory, a form of consciousness, a sensibility, a felt connection to the past. And here's what he said, and I have to say, I used this as the epigraph for this book. It, it made such an impression on me when I came across it. 
In easy times, history is more or less of an ornamental art. But in times of danger, we are driven to the written record by a pressing need to find answers to the riddles of today. In times of change and danger, when there's a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, a sense of continuity with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present. That is why in times like ours, when old institutions are caving in and being replaced by new institutions, not necessarily in accord with most men's preconceived hopes, political thought has to look backwards as well as forwards. That's a marvelous statement today. Um, and you consider it was written in early 1941, before Pearl Harbor, before anything had, st the tide had started to turn at a time when one might have been justified in saying, there's never been anything like this. There's never, there's never been a fighting machine as fearsome, as cruel, as remorseless as Hitler's. Um, there is no reason for hope looking to the past. We are living in an unprecedented time. Well, those, those pastors didn't think so. Uh, and he thought this lifeline of connection to the past was a, a key element in our survival. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, on June 6th, 77 years ago, uh, came the answer, something we should remember, D-Day. I mentioned Normandy, that was what I was referring to. Uh, it was not long before the hopeless situation became uh, one that was full of triumphal hope. Uh, so we should remember that when we think about the hopeless or very frustrating times in which we're living now. This is nothing compared to the challenges of the past, which we have surmounted. Uh, um, so what was true in 1941 is no less true in 2021. It may even be more true. History has many uses, but one of its chief uses is to release us from the mental prison of the present and give us freedom to wander through time and space, to understand and learn from our past, yes, but even more elementally, to know and savor our rootedness in the things that have come before us. Given the matrix-like hold of our digital technologies, we may find ourselves needing that red pill release more than ever, which means we need to do a better job of equipping our people with that mental freedom and imparting to them the confident knowledge that we still share a common American story. It isn't too late for that. And certainly we are in the right place with the right people and the right organization uh, with the right leadership uh, to begin that test. So let's do it. Thank you all very much. Oh, okay, time, time for two questions. Yes, sir. Well, uh, as you said in your question, there are a lot of different ways and reasons for doing, to, for memorializing. Let me, let me cite one that I found really quite striking. And, and uh, I spent a, a semester in Rome as a Fulbright professor. And my, we used to go uh, to the, the opera every now and then. And I don't know whether any of you have ever been to the, you know, 
I'm not going to try it at my Teatro del Opera, whatever it is. Um, and at one time, I, we got there early, and I was just sort of sitting back in my chair and, and looking up at the ceiling, and I saw a medallion above the stage. Some of you were looking at me knowingly. That, uh, it, and inscribed on that was the name of Mussolini. Uh, <laughs> and, and now, there are still Italians who quietly admire Mussolini. Not many of them, but uh, or at least I'm, I didn't meet many of them. But um, I think it just, it just, the decision was made to keep that there, even though this was a man that, uh, that they did not want to honor. Uh, of course, he, he died in the most ignoble way imaginable. Uh, um, uh, but there was some sense that, well, this is part of our past, and we, we're going to, you know, the AOR housing, which is now very fashionable in Rome, is all built by Mussolini with that sort of uh, futurist design. Um, that's all there. It, it, uh, there. There's a sense of coming to terms with a, a very mixed past that... Um, that, that, that the Italians, I think the Romans anyway, show in this, in this instance. Now, that, that's not a complete answer to your question. Should um, uh, a, a little town in South Carolina uh, take down its Robert E. Lee monument? Well, I think there's a decision to be made there uh, a, by the community, an informed decision. I think memorialization, particularly of public artifacts, uh, shouldn't necessarily be sort of permanent and forever. I think communities can and should reconsider uh, from time to time if there's a strong feeling. I don't think some commission operating out of Washington should tell them what they should memorialize or not. Um, but I think that to answer your question more generally, I think there has to be a kind of confluence between private meaning and public meaning um, and, a, and a rough consensus about both of those things. That would be the ideal way of, of, of constructing a memorial. Not the Soviet style is to sort of impose a public meaning that you either hope to impress upon the, the public mind or want to forbid any space for other forms of recognition. Um, uh, I think that that is not ideal. I think that's uh, tyrannical and oppressive and, and also quite useless because it's, it's uh, placing before people a lie and uh, expecting them to believe it. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, something that has a consensual basis, uh, I think what happened with the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, for example, I think is a shame. This is not this is a, a memorial that passed muster with Frank Gehry and his contingent of uh, architectural friends, but not with the people. The, it, it, it's not a it's not a people friendly. It's not a populist friendly um, monumentalization. Um, so I don't. know, There's a lot to talk about there. I mean, really, you know, since your question um, is a question about the, the the civic arts, the arts in civil society and, and, and public expression of them. And uh, it's a complicated thing, but I think in a democracy, it can't be the province just of the experts, of, the, of an expert class. It has to be to have a more general reach. Uh, so, interesting question. And you know, the canon also, you were started out talking about great books. That, you know, I, I think that also needs to be reconsidered all the time. I, I, I don't think I don't like calling it the canon because it implies comparison to the canon of scripture, which is a different thing. We don't reconsider that. Uh, so, you know, you know, uh, the Book of James. I don't really have a use for that. I, it, let's take that out. No, but um, Rabelais in the, in the great books, you, know, you might include it for a generation. You might take it out for the next generation. You know, it's sort of on the edge. You not take Plato's Republic out in all likelihood. I think we have a qu question here. Thank you. The, uh, the question I have is this sort of American moment of reinterpreting our history and the replacement of history with narratives about history. Do you see this happening in other countries around the world? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Talk a little bit about that, if you will. Yeah, well, and this would, this, this would segue a bit into some of what Josh Mitchell was saying, because I think what you see in not every place, this is not happening in Japan, for example, which is still yet to come to terms with his past, but, um, but a lot of Western countries particularly are, are involved in the same sort of uh, movement to um, dig up, acknowledge what is sorted in their past and somehow perform some kind of expiation, which as Josh pointed out, it doesn't really work well in a post-theological world, in a, in a purely secular environment. But um, there's, a, there's a wonderful book by, uh, uh, actually by Peter Berger's son, uh, Peter Berger's name was invoked a little while ago, and uh, um, Thomas Berger, uh, about guilt in the past. And he, and he looks at a number of different countries and how the historiography uh, and the way that that historiography is being taught to young people in those countries is, is you know, there's Howard Zinns all over the place. Uh, uh, actually, probably less talented than Howard Zinn, who, uh, who unfortunately was a pretty good writer uh, and therefore, you know, was uh, easy, uh, easy to read, pleasant to read for people who didn't sort of gag on the things he was actually saying. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think this is, uh, uh, I think this is uh, a, this is, a, it's a moment of the West. And maybe it has been a moment of the West for, for a while, possibly since 1918 or so. I mean, that in, in some ways you could argue that Europe has never recovered from the First World War. Um, but uh, there's there's a, a, a tremendous amount of soul searching that's not baked into the cake of Western, you know, civilizational consciousness, and it affects our historiography. Um, uh, I think, and I think it's for countries that were much more colonial powers than we were. It's a, it's a true, uh, truly searing reckoning. But there's also a response. Someone like Pascal Bruckner in France, for example, is really great. In, in, in take, pushing back against uh, this sort of wallowing in guilt position and, uh, and finding a, a, a plausible middle ground that acknowledges, uh, acknowledges uh, the, the evils of the past but doesn't allow them to swamp the achievements that went with those. So um, that's what, you know, we, we need to, um, I was just talking to, at lunch, uh, and when we were still eating, about um, how there's uh, the bar is set too high now for heroes, that we almost have set the bar so high that there can be no heroes. Um, and, you know, un, un, who has the saying, unhappy is the land that is in need of heroes? Well, that's every land. Every land needs heroes. We need uh, embodiments of the ideal. Uh, that we can uh, that we can be guided by, but not necessarily in, in in a sort of mythic or fairy tale way, but by the truth. The truth of George Washington is enough for me, uh, even with his flaws. Uh, and we have a number of people like that. Martin Luther King. Uh, we, because of uh, David Garrow's work recently, we know that his his personal life was much more sordid then uh, this is a great embarrassment. New York Times has yet to publish a story about any of this. And uh, the Northern New Yorker, both places that Garrow took his research to. Why can't we, are we really unable to process the idea that this man could have been enormously heroic, courageous, risking the death that eventually he met every day and conscious of that, conscious of the threats against him. Um, and yes, his, his sexual sins were grievous, not just peccadilloes, but much worse than we had thought. Well, we have to have the maturity to absorb that. And I don't think, particularly we don't, in, in our Twitter-pated uh, you know, media, that we have the ability to do that right now. But I think the longer horizons of history help, help us to think more clearly, more rationally, more generously, about those things. I mean, who among us can stand in a light that we 
proposed to train upon all of our eminences. Uh, not me. I, I'll hide under the table if you start shining that light on me. <laughs> so uh, do we have time for yeah. more? Thank you. I know you have a couple minutes, uh, just a couple minutes left, oh. so I appreciate it. I'm here as long as you want. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, uh, Dr. McClay, for uh, the awesome talk and Q&A so far. Uh, I have a question as pertains to educating college students in particular uh, in a kind of respect and reverence for our history and traditions. I think part of the appeal that more ideological approaches to history like the 1619 Project have is that they are simple. They're easy to accept, um, and I think in many ways they're validating and affirming for students. Whereas having to reckon with the complexities of history uh, is a difficult task, and it's something that takes a kind of self-reflection that can be ugly, and it can be a difficult sort of road to take. So how can we encourage students to, instead of sort of taking the path of least resistance, take the sort of harder road towards things that are true or good? Well, I might disagree a little bit with some of the premise of your question. I think actually students find the 1619 view of things, many of them very disturbing. Yeah, I mean, white students particularly, but um, and, and their students of, you know, this point was made by Yuval last night and by several speakers today that it's as much as the, the whole woke thing drives us nuts and we're driven to a sort of contempt for it. A lot of the, the, the young people I know who are most under the spell of that are in some ways morally admirable. They're just ill-informed and they're sometimes kind of stupid actually, but uh, kind of willfully stupid. Or, or stupefied, but but there's something there's something driving that that is not unadmirable. And as Josh said, he says, I don't want a world without guilt. You know, guilt is part of our sort of moral nervous system that we absolutely ha must have. We don't want to be overwhelmed by it just in the way that someone I don't know, but someone with autism is overwhelmed by stimulation, so they can't operate in the world. We don't want to have that much guilt. But it's part of the sort of regulatory system by which we assess where we are. So um, I think, you know, and we don't judge the truth or falsehood on the, of the 1619 by how, does it make us feel too guilty or just the right guy? No, it, the past is what it is, and we have to try to come to terms with what it is. But um, this is not exactly, this, I think this partly answers your question from an oblique direction. I think it's really important for us in the classroom to not come in waving the flag and playing uh, Stars and Stripes Forever and marching around in an Uncle Sam suit or otherwise sort of, um, you know, being sort of uh, taking advantage of our position to sort of force them to be subjected to our patriotic paroxysms. But um, I think it's really important for kids who are silent because often they're the ones who need somebody to um, echo their, to voice the sentiments they feel afraid, especially in this environment that we are now, uh, who feel afraid to voice them. So I think we have to kind of get out there and um, not to say, well, you know, I don't care what you think. I, you know, I'm a Republican or what, you know, that's not important. In fact, I view that as a, a, a as reason to my profession. I try to be as inscrutable as I can. It's not easy because they Google you and then they discover, you know, what you've been writing. But, um, but, to, but in the classroom to try to do that. Um, as I mentioned today with teaching John Stuart Mill, you know, uh, and I've never uncritically admired Mill, to be honest with you. Right now he seems like the best thing since sliced bread, but, but in a larger stage, no, I'm, I'm not a fan of Mill. But uh, but I tried to defend him on the, some, some of the same grounds that now uh, the woke Arati are, are saying we should not have free speech. There's no such thing as free speech. And, and, it, and it, to the extent it exists, it's terrible. Uh, uh, it, uh, um, but, you know, you, I, I tried to play the role of that sort of person in the class. I tried to do that, and it's sort of fun, uh, but it's also a better educational experience. But I, I think it's, it's, it's important to let those quiet ones see somebody who, who loves America, who's not abashed about it, um, 
but it's also not going to hit you over the head with it. It's a sort of delicate thing. But I, I think, and I think it's, it's a lot of times, you know, another part of the answer to your question is that by the time they get to college, it's often hard to correct the foundations. You know, yesterday I was back at Hillsdale and I was speaking to K through six teachers and impressing on them, you know, it, well, I, I, somebody talked about elementary schools. I, well, I like the term elementary. I like the term primary better because what you're doing is laying the foundation. Uh, you're telling the story in a way that is both truthful and foundational, that's something that can be built on. And so that when recognition of the complexities come along, you don't say, oh, I had no idea. George Washington is like, out with them. You know, I can't be contaminated with that. No, you don't feel the need to do that if you start with the right foundation and the right understanding of human nature and our fallibility, our imperfection. And uh, every hero has those things, the shadow side. So, thank you all for your, your time, your attention. Oh, oh. My, my protection. <laughs> Wilmington, you might need it, actually. That's yeah. a sad reality. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill McClay, uh, Thomas Lynch. Thanks for making this possible. What a memorable, wonderful uh, way to commence a new tradition.